Good morning. This is Bob with County Records Research. Today is May 5th, 2017, Cinco de Mayo for the year 2017. Can't think of a better way to have a party than to find some opportunities to buy foreclosure properties, can you? So I've activated the visual portion of our presentation and uh, it's about 1145, so let's go shopping. Um, you can see the uh, the property search screen of our website. I've already logged into my account and since this is a Friday we're going to jump right in and do a shopping trip. Uh, um, we've got a few people on the line here so if anybody has any suggestions you're welcome to type them into the little chat window there uh, and I'm happy to respond to any questions you've got. Um, we're going to go ahead and do some quick shopping so what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify uh, for the benefit of the search Los Angeles County South my old stomping ground. I like to search properties in this area. You'll notice if I put my cursor over the Los Angeles County South um, title bar that I can see a little uh, dialogue window opens up and gives me a whole list of cities. Now the reason LA County is split into four pieces is that if you do a, um, uh, put your cursor over all Los Angeles County, look at how big this list is. It literally goes off the page. So whenever we're searching LA County, I always recommend be specific in your target areas. You're going to find that we emphasize the importance of knowing where we're looking. Uh, this is like using a treasure map. If you're digging for gold, you want to make sure you find that rich vein of the opportunities that's there. Foreclosures are the same way. If I'm targeting properties in Long Beach, I only need to search LA County South. That being said, let's go shopping in Long Beach. So I've got LA County South selected, and I'm going to scroll down a little bit. This is my single property search option. You'll notice I was just looking at a property and here's a parcel number in my parcel number box. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that because I'm going to be using this section in just a few moments once we've done some basic searches and found some properties we're interested in potentially buying. So first of all, my single property search is for my secondary research. My primary workhorse for the website is my general property search screen. So you notice under general property search, I have notices a default filed, I have upcoming trustee sales, I have new REOs, and then over here on the right, I've got canceled sales, bankruptcies, and properties that are sold to bidders. Now, I don't commonly use every one of these options, as a matter of fact, I most commonly will use the notice to default filed option, which is the first choice, but it's also the default choice. And you'll notice, so whenever I come to this page, notice the default will be selected already for me. Now, below that choice option, this is our category section of the property search screen where I can categorize my search. I can be very specific if I want to. So let's just say for argument's sake today that I'm looking for multifamily properties and I want to target the Long Beach area. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select uh, notice as a default, which is my default. I'm going to accept that. But down below, I've got the property use window, and in, inside the window it says any type. My default in this window is any type of property. But let's say, for instance, I'm interested in multifamily and I'm going to pick apartment. So now I've localized my search option to my recent notices of default, and I've chosen a use code of apartment. Now, I'm a less is more strategist. The less, the less options I pick in this section, the more opportune I'm going to be to find the, uh, the properties I'm interested in. So if I pick apartment as a use code, I've just eliminated residential, uh, commercial, a lot of other codes that will no longer come up in my search. So what, what I want to do then is I'm not going to go ahead and type in a specific city. Because another thing is, let's say, say I am interested in Long Beach. Well, there's North Long Beach, there's Signal Hill, there's, uh, there's a lot of areas, uh, Rossmore, so there could be areas that are within the Long Beach general area that I want to take advantage of. I mean, there could be a, there could be a, a, a 20 unit building in Artesia that's just gone into, or Lakewood, 
that I would miss if I typed in a specific city. So because I'm targeting a specific property type, I'm going to go ahead and leave the city boxes open. Now, notice there's also a zip code uh, option, and notice to the right of the word city there are boxes, one, two, three boxes, and then to the right of the word zip code there are three boxes, one, two, three boxes. Now, so I can be as picky as I want to be, or like I said, I can pick a property type and then do my research based on that. And I'm going to use the whole South Bay, the whole LA County South Zone, so I can pick anything from El Segundo to Paramount to Redondo Beach. And I want to see everything that is a multifamily. Now, my report format, I choose standard as a rule of thumb because it offers us the most information the most bang for our buck so to speak in that I've got mapping functions I've got photos I've also got links to other sites like Zillow and Trulia so I can do comparison and contrast so we're gonna do some shopping of multifamily units and I'm first gonna look at notice as a default to see what kind of records I get now because again I've selected apartments I have limited the numbers of properties that are going to pull up in my net. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take this listed date range for my notice as a default. This is two weeks ending in today's date. Well, what if, to, what if uh, last week was light? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take the 421 in the first box and I'm going to back that up all the way to April 5th. So notice I just took a two-week range and made it into a four-week range to give myself the most potential results from this search. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit search. Now, notice we have two search buttons here. We have search without polygon, and we have search polygon. Notice the map below. The polygon map is an essential part of your search program in that if I get really uh, focused on a target area, let's say that I like this Long Beach area here, that I could draw a map very specific to a target area that would just include that target area. That's what the polygon map is all about. Now, I want to go without the polygon map for the moment because I've selected a use code and that gives me a very specific list of properties. So let's go ahead and hit search without polygon and see what we get. Okay, see, now what happened? I just ran a search of all of LA County South, our South Bay Zone, with just multifamilies selected. So these are all going to be multifamily properties at the notice of default stage. Now, those of you that have attended a lot of our Friday presentations, you're probably well aware that normally I focus on notices of trustee sale. So I did want to make this a little different for, uh, for Cinco de Mayo. I wanted to focus on default notices, and I wanted to focus on multifamily just to kind of change it up a little bit. Okay, because normally I look at residential and normally I look at notices of sale. But, you know, people have asked us, how do you go after the notice of default? So we're going to start down the report and see what we got. Now, notice with my map results, I've got some orange push pins on the map. Above the map, it says results from 0 to 20 of 20. So I've got exactly 20 records and I've got exactly 20 records visible. So this is a perfect search result. I didn't plan this but I'm happy with what I've got. Now, once I've got my search results as NODs, they're just going to kind of be random. Notice the cities here in the column second from the left. I got Whittier, Hermosa Beach, Inglewood, Pico Rivera. They're all kind of mixed up. So I'm going to click on the word city one time. Now, what happens is this sorts them now by city. And so now I've got them sorted Wilmington, Whittier, Southgate, Pico Rivera, Montebello, it's all going down in, in a progression based on the actual city. So I've got Wilmington here. This is a property on East M Street. This is, says four bedrooms, two baths. Now, since these are multifamily, I always kind of gauge it based on the bathroom. So I think this is a duplex. So let's look at what we've got to play with. I've got a market value of about 371000 If it's a residential uh, multifamily, if it's less than five units, then it's going to have a market value in our system. Okay. If it goes above, if it goes to five and above, then it's considered commercial property, and then we'll probably not have an accurate gauge 
of market value. So just keep that in mind. Part of what we're doing when we're exploring these opportunities is just keeping in mind that uh, we know what we're looking at. So this, I'm guessing, is a duplex worth about 370000 we see a foreclosing second loan, notice our loan position column, and our senior junior loan column indicates that there's a first ahead of it of 135 grand. Now again, let's emphasize, our loan position column tells us which loan is foreclosing, then our senior junior loan column represents the foreclosing loan as the slash, okay? So the foreclosing loan is always represented as the slash here, so that slash is a second, so anything senior to the second, such as a first, will be indicated ahead of the slash. And so that's why we have a foreclosing second and 135000 in front of the slash. So I know if I open the profile, the asterisk will be on the second loan, and I know that the senior loan, the 135, will be ahead of it, but our system does indicate auction equity of 116000 that's telling me that the second loan foreclosing plus the 135 are 116,000 less than this 371. So we're probably looking at somewhere around 250 grand total in terms of debt on the property. So this is actually looking interesting to me. So I'm going to take my mouse cursor and I'm going to click on the M Street property and we're going to open the profile. Okay, so what do we have? Uh, we have a first of 135,000 and a second that was 91,000 from 2002. Now I'm saying was because notice the delinquency above it, delinquent amount is 28,154. So I think this 91,000 was probably paid down some. This is a 15 year old note. So this was paid down some. Our system can't do all the math accurately what it can do is it can add together certain sums. So it's adding the 91 and the 28,000 together um, to be about, a, what, 119,000, um, okay? Plus we've got about 135 here, so those together form about 250, and so that's why the system was saying that they, uh, there's, about, uh, there's, there's an equity position of about 116,000, because it's comparing the 371,000 to about 250 that's owed. Okay, so it's just doing a compare and contrast. Now I was right, looking at this record, this is, now this is a notice of default record. You'll notice it's pretty short and sweet. At the bottom we have the beneficiary, that's the lender, Bank of America. Above that we have our property detail and taxes sections. So this gives us a link to the tax collector's website so we can check their taxes. It also shows us that we indicate 2016 was paid. Um, so there probably may be one payment behind. That's very common with properties in, in default. Now the property detail section describes the property itself. It says it's a duplex. It was built in 1965 four bedroom, two baths, so it's probably two one and two one, okay? Now it indicates the building size is about um, 1,746 square feet and the lot is 4,900. On the right, we have that estimate of value at the top, at the center. We have a link to Zillow to see if it's for sale. I always like to click that just to find out and no, it's off the market. Zillow says the place is worth 443 and our system says it's worth 371. I like to point this out on our Friday presentations. Notice the difference. That's a pretty big difference of about $70,000. And wouldn't you want to know which one's which before you jump in and make an offer to buy this property? If you're looking at a $440,000 property, then that's a big difference between that and the 370. So I would make sure I know what I'm dealing with, apples and apples, and make sure I make an offer accordingly because I wouldn't want to buy this property thinking it's worth 440 and then find out reality is worth the 370. Now, as a buyer, as a general rule, I use the more conservative price point as my valuation because going into the deal, I always want to offer the low price. Okay, because I'm a buyer. If I was the seller, then I would want to get uh, the higher price, obviously. This is how we do business. So the seller's always going to come from the perspective of I've got a $440,000 house if they know what they're doing. 
Okay. Now, if I'm making an offer as the potential investor, then I want to set my target based on the fact that I either going to um, sell this property as a flipper, or I'm going to turn this into a money maker, either way as a rental. Now, either way, I want to get the best price possible. So if I go in thinking this place is worth 370, then I can't go wrong. If I go in thinking it's worth 440 and I'm mistaken, then I could really shoot myself in the foot. So we always encourage you be conservative in terms of how you value the property. Okay, so you don't wind up walking yourself into uh, a corner and paying too much for a property. It's really hard to dig yourself out if you overpay. If you underpay, then you're always golden. Okay, so in this situation, we have a foreclosing second loan. We have a lot of equity in this property. I could go make an offer to the owners. Now, let's look above the, the property details, and what do we see? We see that we've got a P.O. box in Wilmington that is evidently their mailing address. So the owners may or may not live in this property. Okay, since the mailing address is a P.O. box, it's possible they live down the street or next door. Okay, I don't know where Salvador and Susana Arroyo live. I do know that Salvador and Susana Arroyo are the trustors. That's who borrowed the money is the trustors. So remember, we're a trustees, uh, we're a, a, a deed of trust state here in California. Every note against a piece of real estate is going to have the loan itself, which is the note. It's going to have a deed of trust that's recorded with the county. That's what these are. The 135 and the 91 are deeds of trust, and these are the dates they were recorded at the county. Okay. Now, in addition to that, um, you're going to have uh, a trustor who borrowed the money. That's the, the couple. And you're going to have a trustee at the time that they recorded the document. And then you're going to have a beneficiary, which is the lender. Here is Bank of America. So you're going to have a trustee that's not listed here. It's, it's blank at the moment. Okay, once we get to the actual notice of sale, if it goes that far, then you'll see the trustee's contact information because they usually end up becoming the, the uh, first and primary point of contact at that point. Okay, so now at this point, the lender is simply hoping that Salvador and Susanna will realize that they have a lot of equity. They've owned the house since 91. They refinanced twice, and that's why they're in trouble now and they simply need to bring their loans current. So now the question comes down to this. Can they pay or is it cuz are they in foreclosure cuz they cannot pay or because they will not pay? I don't think it's a will not issue cuz they got a lot of equity in the home. I think there's some kind of a crisis here in the family. So that's an opportunity when there's equity in the property and a crisis in the family to approach an offer to buy the property. So first things first, since their address is a P.O. box, I'd use the property address and go there and find out if Salvador and Susanna actually live at the house and simply have a P.O. box for their mail. Or are they living somewhere else and there's renters in the property, in which case they might know how we can get a hold of Salvador or Susanna. Okay. Now, if I'm going to make an offer, then I'm going to use the offer form, item 22 on our forms page. If I scroll down the page, I can select forms and go to that forms page and select item 22 and print it out. That's the, the offer form. And then we can coach you on how to write it up. So I'd make my offer to Salvador and Susanna to buy their property. Make a decision. What are you willing to pay? If it's actually worth 370, what's your offer going to be? 300,000? Remember, the hardest challenge that we have as an investor is to make firm decisions and stick by them so we can get out the front door, get in our car, drive over to this property, and make an offer to the property owner. If we can't make some firm decisions on how to acquire this property, how are we going to get to that next step? Okay. The next step doesn't happen until we, you know, what, what is the, the, the Chinese saying? The, uh, every long journey starts with the first step or uh, a journey of a thousand steps starts with the first one, something like that. But we have to take that first step. We have to decide that we want to buy that property for a certain amount of money, and then we decide how we can get there. And I think this is kind of wide open. Now, I don't know if I could buy this second because the lender's Bank of America. Uh, I could try and reach out and buy the first if I was going to try and buy a note on the property. So Kurt would call that a senior lender buyout if I'm trying to buy the first loan at a discount and acquire the property by buying 
the note. If we ever try and buy a property by purchasing the note, that's our junior lender buyout or senior lender buyout strategy in this case, then what I would want to do is buy the loan at a discount and then become the lender. Now, in this case, we have a foreclosing second, and like I said, it's Bank of America. I don't know if I could buy that note. I don't think it's possible at this point. I think my two best bets are to approach Salvador and Susanna and offer to buy their property, or my second option is to follow this through if, for instance, I go to the property and I find out that Salvador and Susanna are no longer around. Okay, if they're no longer around, this property could go to auction because, again, I don't think it's because they won't pay. I don't think they've made an active decision not to make their house payments because this is income property. They're making money. I think there's something that's a crisis, and we might have lost Salvador one, one year and then Susanna the next. If that's the case, if there's no one there to handle the paperwork, the check doesn't get written, the bank doesn't get paid, it's very possible this property could be in foreclosure because there's no one to process the paperwork. If that's the case, then this will go to auction because no one's there to sell the property either. And, it, and again, we don't know until we approach the property and find out more. And if we find out that there is no way to do a deal because there's no one to do a deal with, then that's when we go to our follow-up strategies. We try and buy the, the 135 first by trying to make an offer to that lender. Or worst case scenario is we wait it out and we go to an auction. Now, this was uh, a notice of default in our system as of the 26th of April. This is very fresh. So that means the lender cannot file a notice of sale until uh, the end of July. So we've got plenty of time to try and negotiate and try and buy the property or buy the first loan. And then if none of those methods work, then we're prepared to bid at an auction uh, sometime late July, early August. Okay. Oh, Carla had a good question. Why would the first sell at a discount in this case? Well, Carla, I gotta tell you, um, I don't worry about whys. Uh, I just worry about weather, okay? Because why would they sell that loan at a discount? Who knows? Maybe this was a seller carryback, you know? Who, whoever, or actually, no, this was a refi. So maybe that lender is a smaller local lender and maybe um, they were getting payments for years and years and years. See, we don't know what they owe on that first because they could owe 100000 because they've been paying it down since 92, and we might be able to buy that loan for 80000 Now, do I know for sure they'd sell it? No. But what if I approach that lender and they're in financial trouble and they need an immediate um, injection of cash? because banks always follow a flow of money, okay? They're a money company. So if I go to that lender to buy that note and I offer them 80,000 because I know they're, uh, I find out they're owed 100, that gives me enough room to make potential profit if someone shows up at my auction on the first and buys the note um, and buys the property, okay? Now, if I reach out, is it possible that the bank's gonna say, no, I'm not interested in selling the note? Yeah, but if someone else did it while you were in the process of waiting for the auction, you'd lose an opportunity. So I always say, you know, don't leave that stone unturned and, let, and find out that someone else did it. This is why we always point out that you should go to the property and make an offer because I can't tell you how many times uh, people have said, well, why should I go approach these people if they were going to sell their property? Why, why isn't it listed already? Because they're just, they, nobody motivated them. Okay, and I can tell you some of the smartest agents use our service and they go to that property owner and they get them to list the property. I was just looking at one earlier today with a client and I go down and I click on the Zillow and sure enough, the property just sold through an escrow in late April and we were talking about him bidding at an auction 20, you know, uh, two weeks from now. And it turns out that auction is going to be canceled because that property already sold. Okay, because somebody went to the uh, homeowner within a week of the notice of default being issued and got a listing because because they because they were hungry and they got it okay and so that makes the opportunity if you're hungry enough you'll reach out to the owner of this first loan and see if they're willing to sell it now if they say forget about it okay i lost uh, that that deal doesn't happen so i move on to the next opportunity so if if you can't get salvador and susanna then you try and get the lender
If you can't get the lender, then you hold out for the auction because that might be the only opportunity to buy this one. Now, I'm going to bring your attention to the map. When I have the map here on the, on the right, I can select either the magnifying glass here to zoom in and out, or I can use the wheel on my mouse. I prefer to use the wheel on my mouse. It just gives me a little bit more control rather than do kind of this Superman thing where I'm bouncing in and out really quick. Okay, I like to use the mouse. Now, once I go and uh, zoom in, I hit my bird's eye option, and I can see the property. Notice I zoom in again once I get to the property, and then I use these little curly arrows to rotate my view. Okay. Not exceptional, it's just, it is what it is. This, this would be a good income property uh, on M Street, okay? Looks like a relatively uh, quiet block. If you go out a little further, this is probably a church over here. Looks like we've got a, a little elementary school right here, so this is all right. It's a nice little residential section, very good spot to have an income uh, multi-duplex. Um, so now, so if I got a good price on this, I would love to just uh, turn this into a money maker. Now I'm going to go back to my road view and back out and see where we're at. So we're right off of PCH near Alameda. Zooming out a little bit more. Okay, so this is centrally located. You've got, um, what highway is this? you got the 405 and the harbor. And then over here you got the 710. So this is centrally located. This is in a good spot. Okay. This would be a great income property or a flip. Um, and then what you just have to decide for yourself is if the market value is worth about 370, what am I willing to uh, to, to pay for this property? It does appear to me um, that they owe probably about um, um, somewhere around 250. I'm guessing because I think they're behind on these loans, but they're not too far behind. And the loans themselves, that was only 226 at the time. So if I think reasonably they owe somewhere around 250, I could go to these folks and offer them 300,000 and find out if they're interested in selling. If they're not willing to do it, then again, approach one of the lenders or be prepared to bid at the trustee sale because eventually uh, if I can't do a deal with them and they're not there to do a deal with anybody else, then eventually this will go to the auction and hopefully I'll be in the right place at the right time and I can capture this opportunity. So that what, that's what that one looks like to me. The very next one on the report, this is a property in Whittier. Now notice again, bedroom and bath is 5-4. So uh, this is either um, um, large duplex or it could be a triplex on Dunton Drive in Whittier. Now, interestingly, this one is worth about 520. It's a, a jump up in value. This is also a foreclosing second, but we have a much larger first. 485,000 is owed on the first. Okay, so there aren't is not a lot of equity here. Our system says only about 19,000 in equity here. So this is one of those situations, as Kurt describes, where I'm going to have to create the equity. Okay, because it's not already there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select the Dunton Drive address and open the profile. Okay, so this is interesting. Now, what I see is I've got a, a we had tagged a foreclosing second loan, okay, and a delinquent amount of 16000 And let's see, what our system is indicating um, is that this is a... Uh, now, what's interesting is I'm missing my TDID here. There's a couple of blank spots here, and you'll notice that this um, October 2007 loan, we show zeros. So this is kind of odd to me. I'm scrolling down. Now, Wells Fargo is the lender, so this is a legitimate loan from 07. Now, whenever I run into a situation like this where I'm missing pieces of the puzzle, because how big is this loan really? I don't know. Okay, now I don't think it's a refinance of the first, but it could be. So let's see if there's any other information. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this APN, Assessor's Parcel Number, and I'm going to left click to the right of the number and I'm going to drag until I cover the whole number. Then I'm going to right click and select Copy. Okay. Now I'm going to go up to the top, and I'm in Google Chrome for the purposes of the presentation. I'm going to select the upper left-hand tab 
um, and I'm going to say um, let's scroll up to the single property search and drop that parcel number. Remember where I just pull, erased that parcel number that was in here before? I'm going to drop a new parcel number in and I'm going to hit search. I just want to see if we have a history in our system for this property. Hopefully we will because I'd like to see if there's more information about that particular foreclosing loan. Okay, so here's what we've got. We've got um, four records in our system for this property. Now, whenever you get multiple records on a profile or on a property in our system, every one of these is a property profile, and every profile in our system is based on one of two types of documents. There's either a notice of default record, or a notice of sale record. Now, notice to the right, I've got four different dates. These are added dates. These are the date we added the record to our system. Now, the one on top is a notice of sale because it has a sale date or, or an auction date. It also has an estimated bid, which is an amount owed on a loan. So this is a record from all the way back in 2014 on a foreclosing first that was owed $600,000. Below that, I have the notice of default that I was just looking at, the one that indicated that I had a foreclosing second, and below that are a couple other notices of default that both indicate that they're foreclosing on a first. So it appears to me that we have a history of foreclosure on a first loan right and then suddenly our systems indicating a second loan although I don't know if I trust that to actually be a second I think they might have gotten a modification on their first loan and I think what we're seeing in terms of the new notice today is that they've fallen behind again on the very same loan I'm guessing that this six hundred thousand uh, dollar figure from 2014, I'm guessing that they got a modification on that and that they've fallen down again on the modification. And so that's my belief system right now. Now, in order to verify my information, I'm going to go back and start looking at the original record from 2013. So this is the Dunton Drive address. And this is that loan that we're showing as a first. The delinquency was 485000 back in 2013. Now, Josefina Gonzalez is the borrower, and Josefina and Jose are on title. So Josefina is the borrower. She had a $485,000 loan. Now, I'm going to point out she bought the place in 2002, and she borrowed the money in 2005. So this is a refi or, or an equity loan. Okay, she took money out. Now, I'm going to back out of that and then go right back to the very next record in our system. This is a notice of default from 2015 that shows she's in arrears by 32000 in 2015 on that very same loan. Okay. Also notice in the property details this is a triplex, so that was a good guess on my part that this is a triplex and not a really big duplex, but it's, you know, it's a decent property. Now also notice that the lender in this case is Wells Fargo. Okay, so now I'm going to back out again and go to the next record in our system. And this is the notice of default that we were just looking at that's indicating that the loan that's foreclosing is actually from 2007. And again, I'm kind of leaning on, I think that this was a re-recording, but it's hard to say. I would have to check with a title company to verify all my information because it seems incomplete to me. What seems to me is back in 2013, they were uh, going to go to foreclosure or go to auction for a $602,000 debt on a $485,000 loan. So that means their loan had increased by well over $100,000. So I honestly think that their situation is dire and they owe a lot more on this property than it appears. So I'm going to close that out. I'm going to go back to the original profile, and I'm just going to tell you what my strategy would be. I would plan to make a short sale offer to Josefina and Jose. Um, see if they're willing to accept it, okay? Because honestly, I think the situation here is one where um, I think they have uh, one loan on the property. I think, I think the payment structure was modified, and I think they might have got it modified again and I think they've fallen down again. I think the principal balance 
on this later loan is actually from the first loan and I think that the 16,000 that they're in arrears is based on a wholly new balance I think they might owe over 700,000 on this place right now I could be mistaken however what's more important than that is that I set a price point remember what I said that journey of a thousand steps starts with the first one right so let me look at my Zillow's estimate I'm also doing this to see if it's on the market and it's not. Zillow says the place is worth 659, almost 660. Now, we say it's worth 521 according to another set of comparables. Notice the huge gap in market value between one source of comparables and another. Now, we also have a link on our resources page to go over to Chicago Title. You need to get some comps that really are an apples to apples comparison and make sure you know what you're dealing with and also assess the market value of the property based on its condition and location. Okay, so I've just used the mapping function to take a look at the property. So it looks like you've got a house in front and a house in back and a shared driveway. And it looks like they're using those funny little um, uh, 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 thingies that go over the car, like a little, like little tent things. So uh, obviously this place might need a little bit of upgrading, okay? But it's perfectly fine as an income property. Okay, and just understand that you're dealing with an area that's probably you know not the highest end, and a lot of these are probably multifamily units. That's how it appears to me. So I would gauge my market value on the neighborhood and on the condition of the property, and then I would set my price. Remember, we say it's worth 521. Zillow says it's worth 660. I'd get some other comparables for the for the neighborhood and then decide how do I want to tackle this one. It looks like I said you've got a you've got a duplex in front and a little house in the back that makes your triplex. That's what I think you've got. And one of the things that Kurt will always tell you is he, he makes a point to go over to the property and count mailboxes. That's a great way of knowing for sure how many units you've got. Once you've set a price point on this property, if it's really worth about 520 as a potential resale value, maybe my offer is about four. If I plan to approach them and offer them for, I have a very strong feeling that's a short sale offer. It doesn't mean I won't make the offer. It just means I need to be prepared to come in with cash or my own funding. I also know that there's a very strong potential that if I do my research that there's only one loan on this property. That's what my gut's telling me. If it is in fact a first that's foreclosing, then that changes what this looks like here. If they owe about seven and it's a first, then this might be an awesome deal at the auction. Okay, remember um, that County Records Research has a bidding service. If this goes to auction, the odds are very high, 9 out of 10, that it will go to sale at the Pomona location, and then we would be able to place bids for you at that location, um, and you would just state for us the most you're willing to spend. So I might set a maximum bid of 420 on this particular property at auction if it goes, knowing that um, the timeline is such that their as of date right above the loan is 324 so that gives me June 24th as the date the notice of sale can be issued which means we're looking at an auction right around um, the second week of July okay so that gives me time to do my preparation research my loan information if you're not sure about your loan research or if you have questions let us know you could research further to find out if it's a possibility to buy the note but I, only, I think the only deal here is if you could either bid on or buy the first loan or get Josefina and Jose to accept a short sale offer. I'm going to close that one out. We're going to go right to the next one. Now, this is also a Whittier property, but this looks a lot more uh, advantageous in terms of all already existing equity. Notice our auction equity column. Now, Kurt will tell you, don't make your decision, don't make or break your decision to make an offer on a property based on auction equity. Many times, like on the one just we just looked at, you can create the equity by making a short sale offer or by redirecting your research and making sure you're clear on the loan information because there can be loans that appear to be duplicates of themselves. Okay, so it's always important that we do our research if we want to look further, but don't hesitate to make an offer for a certain amount of money. 
the bottom line is if I offer a certain amount of money, I'm either going to close that escrow or I'm not, and I don't have to overthink it. Okay. Now, in this particular case, this looks like a pretty cut and dried opportunity on the Comstock property in Whittier. The place looks to be worth about 676000 They have a foreclosing second and a first of 170. So the second plus the first adds up to a figure that's about 236,000 below this amount. So they owe about 440, I'm guessing, on the property, and I'm going to open the profile. Now this also looks like a triplex, so I'm going to hit the, uh, the search button and open it up. Oh, this is a duplex. So this is a two-bedroom, one-bath, Actually, it's probably a two-two and a one and 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 a um, gosh. We'd have to go look at it, but uh, yeah, you got six, so maybe yeah, so maybe you're at four and two and two and one. Maybe that's what it is. So it's probably a four-bedroom, two-bath, and a two-bedroom, one-bath. So you probably got a regular type house, and then maybe a secondary house. Now. Benjamin Aravalo is the trustor here. So Benjamin by himself is the trustor and the owner. Now also notice the mailing address when it matches the property address, that means he lives in one of the units. So Ben lives in one of the units and he's renting the other out. Now also notice something. This place was built in 1913. We're looking at an antique. This property is over 100 years old. So you're going to probably have some uh, deferred maintenance questions, but that's okay. Now, notice also his purchase date is 93, and the loan date is from 03 in first position, 07 in second position, so these are refi loans. So, bottom line is, I know he's owned the place for a little while, he's probably an older guy, he's the only one on title, um, and it does appear to me there's a lot of equity, so why would Ben let his house go into arrears like this? Also notice, this is a $264,000 second. The delinquent amount is only $5,000, okay? So I'm guessing he's only behind by about three months. I'm wondering, did something happen to Benjamin, okay? This is a good question. If you go to the property, you might find out that Benjamin's no longer with us, in which case he can't accept an offer, can he? But he might have family members, and you can make an offer to them, okay? So part of our research as an investor is to look at the situation, kind of weigh it, and ask ourselves, what can we do? Now, our estimated value on this one is 676. Let me see really quick what Zillow says. Zillow says 648, so Zillow's less. Notice on some of them Zillow's higher, and on some of them we're higher. That's because everybody's pulling comps from different areas, so yeah, you just gotta master the art of determining value. Okay, once you've determined value, then you have to take a step back and say, okay, if that's the value I can sell it for, what am I willing to spend to buy it, which will also cover me for my rehab costs, if there are any, and if I'm paying a realtor, and my other costs that might be incurred in the process, such as title insurance. So I want to make sure that I'm going to walk away with a certain amount of profit. Don't be afraid to do a simple spreadsheet and try and work it out for yourself okay because either you can or you can't okay and you need to set a price point that makes sense going into escrow so when you buy that property you're going to be okay okay so bottom line we want to make sure that we've thought it through okay and we want to make sure if we go to make an offer that we have a sense that we're getting a good price or if we're going to bid at auction or if we're going to make an offer to buy a note. Now, I always point out, you're probably going to spend the least amount to buy a note. The second highest amount is what I would bid at auction. And finally, the most I would spend to buy a property is making the offer directly to the property owner um, and then waiting it, waiting for it to go through escrow. But that can vary. You know, you got you got to learn your process, learn your method. So this place looks like it's worth about 648 according to Zillow, 676 according to us. I would go with the 648 if I'm making an offer. Okay. Now, using the mapping function, I'm going to zoom in and hit bird's eye. Okay. So remember what I said. So so it looks like you got a big house in front and the little house in the back. So this is like the two bedroom one. And this is the, what, the 4-2? Yeah, so this is a 4-2 up in front, and this is the 2-1 in the back, and it looks like we've got an alleyway here, 
okay? So we know what it is. We know what we got. So we could go to Benjamin. He's probably living in the front house and renting out the back or, you know, the other way around. I mean, if it's just one guy, he might be living in the back and just renting out the front to a family, okay, and making more money. So uh, now if we go to the property, we might find out he's no longer there but he might have a family member that's taking care of business because maybe he just passed away a few months ago. If that's the case, then we approach that family member and we offer to buy the property from them. If it, uh, there's nobody to pick up the pieces, and this happens a lot, if there's nobody to pick up the pieces, then this one can go to auction. Now notice here, the as of date on the notice of default was, all the, was back in April. So we're looking at um, July 10th for the date that they could issue the notice of trustee sale. So we're looking at approximately the beginning of August to buy this one at the auction. So you can try and get it before then. Uh, also, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't pass on the idea of trying to buy one of these notes either. Um, and so, so you know, keep them, now keep in mind, Bank of America is the foreclosing second, but who owns this first? Okay, if you could buy that first at a discount, if they're in arrears and, and they can't get any communication with the borrower, and they don't know to go by to, to do this research here, and you might contact them and find out they're owed 150 grand and they'll take, you know, 120. Um, why not? If I could buy that note for 120 that's owed 150, then I would conduct my own auction or I'd wait for the next person to become the owner of the property and let them pay me off, okay? Bottom line though is, if we could get the note at a discount, that gives us a chance to acquire the property. If nothing else happens, this one could go to auction and then the opportunity is to bid at the trustee sale, pay off this second, and then take over payments on the existing first or simply refinance it if we wanna hold on to this property and turn it into an income unit. Next one is on a property on Virginia Avenue in Southgate. Now, this has eight bedrooms, four baths, so this could be a fourplex or a triplex or a duplex. Not sure which. We'll find out in a moment. The estimated value on this property is about 450. Okay. Now, our system is indicating this this one is the first one in the list that's a foreclosing first. So this is a first loan foreclosing. Notice in the senior junior loan column, if it's a first foreclosing, the, the loan is always represented by the slash. So in senior position is a zero. In, now in junior position to the right of the slash is 260000 as a second. So we have a foreclosing first that's taking the property through the process of foreclosure and we have a second that's 260,000. Now, what's gonna be unusual with my auction equity in this picture is the auction equity is showing 53,000 positive, but it's also omitting this 260 from the picture because at auction, a first wipes out the second. So, in the math on this one, before I open the profile, I know they're upside down because I know the equity is only 53,000, but the second's 260,000. So they're about $210,000 upside down if I add both loans together. Notice that I've known that, I've figured that out without even opening the profile, so I'm already ahead of my game. So I know they're upside down, so if I'm gonna go make an offer to the property owner, it's a short sale. I also know that realistically I probably want to try and buy a first note, although I could buy the second note if it's at a really deep discount. So um, Carla had a question of what form do we use to buy a note? Well, I'll tell you what, Carla, I'm going to go down to our forms page and I'm going to click on forms. Now, we have our offer to purchase non-performing note as form number 19. Okay, now when I open this up, you're going to notice something right away. That's a real simple form, isn't it? There is no official form to offer to purchase a non-performing note. When we offer to purchase a non-performing note, we're using this as a model because what we're trying to do is we're trying to buy a note uh, and become a lender on a property. The, the, the limits of how we do this are pretty slim because it's not buying real estate. If I'm gonna go buy real estate, then there are a lot of standards that have to be followed in order for me to acquire real estate, 
uh, to meet all the terms of the law, especially if I'm going through a realtor or a broker, and then they've got to follow all the obligations they have to protect their insurance and their licenses and everything else. So bottom line, though, is when I go to buy a note, it's uh, I liken it to uh, to going and 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 uh, uh, having somebody um, uh, give sign over their paycheck to me, uh, and I give them cash, and I just pay them a little less cash than than is on the check, because I know that I'm going to have to deposit that check and wait for it to clear. Okay, when I go to buy a note, I'm buying an IOU. I'm buying an amount that's owed to that party. Now I do have to do my homework. And you'll notice that on this offer to purchase a non-performing note, the meat of this form is our homework. This offer is contingent upon a review and confirmation of the note itself, the promissory note, including any modifications. The current balance. Now, this is a very soft way of saying I need to see a statement of exactly what the history is on this loan. When you go to buy a note, you want to make sure you know what's owed on that note. You want to make sure the person who's selling you that note has the original, not a copy. You need to make sure that they've kept an accurate accounting of how the borrower has paid them because the borrower could have made a lot of payments and if they don't have an accurate accounting, how do you actually know what they're owed? So the very important thing is when you're going to buy a debt, you know what that debt is, and you also know the status of any senior debt. That's the second bullet point here, because if I'm buying a second and there's a first on the property, uh, I need to know what's owed both loans. Okay, I need to know A, what I'm paying for that second, B, what's owed against the senior debt, and then C, what's the value of the property in comparison and contrast to these debts. I don't want to overpay for a note, otherwise I've just simply given somebody a, a present by paying them for a note that has little or no value to me. So one of the things that you're going to find that makes us different as a company is we can help you evaluate these opportunities. And Kurt will coach you through this process because he's done it many times. You can evaluate a note opportunity step by step by step. Just print out this offer to purchase a non-performing note, have it available to you when you call up and talk to Kurt and ask him, you know, have a specific note in mind though because he's going to want to coach you emphatically based on the, the facts, what's going on with that particular note, so that you can then do your secondary research. Once you've done research on a note or two, you'll get a hang of it. You'll understand the process that you're following because this is our own homework to make sure that we know what we're doing and that we have a process involved in buying the note. Once you understand the process, you'll understand what questions you're going to ask and why, and you'll avoid buying a note that you shouldn't acquire. We're a company that processes foreclosures. Therefore, we know what to look for in the note. And we also know that every note, you have to have an original. Plus, you have to have a deed of trust here in California that matches it, like a pair of shoes. Okay, Same date, same dollar amount, same property. It all needs to line up appropriately so that that note has inherent value to you. And so you can set a price on it. Okay, because that's, again, just like you start that first step of the long journey with a, um, um, by setting a price on the property, you have to set a price on the note that's based on the price you set on that property. You can't have one without the other. So it's very important that you follow your processes and then you just simply slide this offer to purchase the non-performing note right in the sequence where it belongs. Now. You also need to do a drive-by evaluation of an approval of the secured property. How do you know that you want to buy that property if you haven't seen it? Okay, now again, this is one of the keys in making an offer to the property owner, even if you've got that offer to buy the note in the back of your mind. Okay, you still go to the house, or, the, or in this case, the duplex, and you still make the presentation to try and buy the property from the homeowner and also have your little check sheet with you so that you can identify for yourself, even if you have to run back to your car and jot down notes really quick before you forget, as to the condition of the property.
is it renter occupied is it uh, is the owner in one of the units or is it or is all the units rented rented um, what's the condition of the property how does the roof look simple facts that when you go and sit down and start crunching some numbers you say aha I did notice I'm going to need to replace that roof and that's going to probably cost me a certain amount of money okay because you crunch all the numbers and you come up with an appropriate price if you think you've got the right number then give us a call with the information in front of you and one of us will be able to coach you through the process and then if you end up buying that note then we can process a foreclosure for you if that's not the note that's foreclosing uh, if the notes already foreclosing then you can continue the process of foreclosure as it's already been begun by the existing lender and don't think that just because some lender has started a foreclosure that they won't sell you the note I've seen by quite a few notes recently where the, the foreclosure is already in process. So don't overlook the opportunity to buy a note that's already in foreclosure because you'd be surprised at how many lenders simply want to shortcut the process and take a payout for a shorter amount and let somebody else uh, pick up the, uh, the ball and run with it. Okay. Now, notice also this form emphasizes that I'm enclosing a copy of a check uh, or bank check to show evidence of proof of funds and this is again to show you're real so what this is is simply a way to get your foot in the door make sure you've examined all the contingency factors and make sure the seller of the note is aware of the contingency factors they must meet in order for you to finalize the transaction if they cannot fulfill all the terms that we've specified here and if you need more clarity give give us a call but if they can't specify or, or meet all these terms then chances are you probably want to walk away from the note purchase and do something simpler like making an offer and taking the property into escrow to the homeowner or simply showing up at the auction after having done your homework for that and bidding at the trustee sale look at every opportunity you never know which way you're going to actually buy that specific property uh, Carla, the amount of the copy of the bank check is completely up to you. For instance, if I was going to offer, you know, fifty thousand dollars to buy a note, I might uh, create a bank check with my bank for a fifty thousand dollar amount. Uh, now, one of the things that we like to also point out is that you don't uh, you're, you're sending them a copy. It's not a negotiable document. Um, and what you can do is you can just make a photocopy. Of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a bank check that you're going to send along with the offer and then you could go turn right around and return that check into your bank if you're not sure um, what to do at, call up and ask for Kurt and he'll work you through the process again what we want to do is we're emphasizing that we have the money Okay, we're not necessarily handing anybody money uh, unless the deal is ready to be made. And if necessary, you can meet at a title company or an escrow office, somewhere with a notary, because when you finally go to buy the note, you do have to have a notary there that actually um, re, um, completes a document called an assignment. And Kurt will tell you all about that when, uh, when you just to talk to him when you're actually working on a deal. Close that one out. Okay. Now I'm back at my forms page and I'm going to hit my back arrow. And now I'm back at my property results. See how easy that is? Now we're back. Okay. Now we're at the last uh, we're at the last of our presentation. I think I was looking at that property uh, on uh, on Virginia, right? So I'm going to open this one up. Right. So this is the one we were just looking at. And this is the loan that's proposing as a first for 365 from 06. Now, notice a pattern here. They bought the property at 99. The loan is from 06, and then there's a second loan from 2016. So what we have is now this was a fourplex. Remember, I said it was 84. So this is a fourplex. Both of the loans are refinanced loans. And, and, so the bottom, and so the bottom line is um, the first is foreclosing and we would have to create equity in the process. Now scrolling down, specialized loan servicing in Irvine. I'm not sure. This is, this is a trustee, not the Benny. 
Okay, so this is a trustee, specialized loan yeah, servicing or servicer. Okay, now you can reach out to this company and request them to uh, forward. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is um, I, I would say I would reach out to specialized loan servicing. Okay, and I would say, you know what, this um, this three sixty five thousand dollar loan from O six, I'm interested in making an offer to buy the note. Also, notice I've got this funny loan. Look at this, October of twenty sixteen. This loan is less than a year old, so I'm curious about this one. So, whenever you see something like this, where you've got a loan that's less than a year old that's in play, and we're going to run out of time here, so I just want to show you one more thing. Whenever you see anything that just looks like it's out of place, take advantage of the single property search option with the parcel number. Plug in that parcel number and hit search. Because I just wanted to check this, and sure enough, this property on Virginia was in default in 2012. Okay, And so their most recent record was that they were in default in 2012 on this very same loan. They owed 420000 Okay, so they owed 420 on the 365 loan, so it had grown by about 60 grand at that point. Okay, so the bottom line is this: they have been in arrears for a long time, and they got somebody to loan them money last year. So I'm curious about this one. I'm very curious about this one because they got somebody to loan them this loan in 2016, and now this loan's threatened to get wiped out. So. If there was an equity position here, I would have to do my research, but the bottom line is this. I don't know if there's equity in this property. I really don't because I think they owe more on this 365 than we think they do. Okay, I think this 365 got modified, and I think that 31000 is off a bigger figure. And I think um, I wouldn't try to buy this second note, but if I could try and reach out to buy this first, that might be the play. Otherwise, I would plan to make an offer to the property owner. Now, this is the first one that I came across that looks like this. Notice, the owner, Maynard Estrada, lives in Colton, California. Here's his address on Iron Horse Circle. And this is a money maker. This is a fourplex. He's collecting the money but not paying the lender. So if I was going to make an offer to buy this as a short sale, I'd need to go to him at his address in Colton, okay, and make him an offer there, okay? So let me scroll in a little bit and just look at the property. Okay, this has got potential. This could be a money maker. Be prepared to go make him an offer over at the property. If he doesn't accept the offer, be prepared to follow this up and bid at the auction or try and reach out to the servicer through the trustee and see if you can make an offer to buy this note at a discount. And just remember, when you're ready to do that, if you have any questions, give us a call. We'll coach you through every step of the process. And we promise you, as long as you ask questions, you'll do it the right way. This has been Bob with County Records Research. This has been our Cinco de Mayo uh, Friday presentation of how to use the website and research Notice of Default Properties for Multifamilies in South LA County. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll hope to see you again real soon.